Um, see, five board members and one o'clock, so we'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's uh, meeting of March 15th, 2023. I'll apologize to all the skiers um, whose faces are here and hearts are elsewhere, um, including mine. Um, but it's a beautiful, lovely day, and so I hope people get to get outside today because it's, you know, a gem of gem of a day for Weaver Honors. Um, we have two main uh, agenda items today. We have um, a presentation by our general counsel, Mike Barber, on um, uh, cost sharing reductions, and then we have uh, hospital budget guidance from Sarah Lindbergh, our director of hospital system finances, um, and we're looking forward to hearing from both of them. Um, I'll turn it to Ms. Susan Barrett, our executive director for the executive director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanted to announce that we've added a meeting for next Wednesday, March 22nd at 9.30 a.m., where we will take up the modification of UVMMC's FY17 enforcement action with a potential vote. So again, that meeting starts at 9.30, and then we'll come back in the afternoon and have our regularly scheduled 1 p.m. meeting. Um, we've also reopened the public comment uh, period for that topic, so please uh, submit any additional comments to us through our web portal, and those are posted on our website under public comments. I also, as I have reminded everyone um, on uh, the for the, the last um, year or so, that we are taking public comments on um, a next potential all-payer model. Uh, the, the Agency of Human Services and the Governor's Office are leading those negotiations and the current model, so any comments we do share with our colleagues. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, we'll take up the meeting minutes from March 8th, uh, 2023. Um, is there any board discussion? All those in favor of approving the March 8th minutes, please say aye. Perhaps I should move, move the minutes first, Chair. Please, yes. I will second them. All those in favor of saying aye. 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 Um, the motion carries and the minutes are approved. Um, I'll turn to uh, Mr. Barber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the record, my name is Michael Barber. I'm general counsel at the board. And last week, um, the board's contracted actuaries at Lewis and Ellis um, and I presented a draft rate review policy for your consideration, and I'm back this week to um, see if you want to adopt that policy, and if you do, to get your vote. Um, there isn't <clears throat> there isn't a lot for me to follow up on from last week. Um, there wasn't a lot of uh, discussion around this, but um, Eric Schulteis. Uh, at the Office of the Healthcare Advocate did make a comment last week that I felt like I should probably respond to. <clears throat> I believe Eric expressed support for an approach like um, New Mexico's because it would prevent gamesmanship by the carriers. If you recall, New Mexico calculated a CSR load itself and required all the carriers in the individual market to use that load when pricing their plans. We did consider uh, doing something similar, calculating a CSR load ourselves based on market-wide data, um, but ultimately concluded that allowing the carriers to continue doing the calculation using their own data would be a better approach. It would result in more accurate rates, and we were comfortable with allowing the carriers to do this because we only have two carriers here in Vermont. We have a very thorough rate review process and we're keyed into this issue now. So I think we can guard against any type of gamesmanship aimed at artificially decreasing the load, for example, through unrealistic assumptions about enrollment or induced demand. Um, and then just, just 
to make it clear, the, the load that New Mexico mandated is quite high at 44%. Um, and that's because they made some assumptions that we just did not feel comfortable with. Um, for example, they assumed that after they, they implemented their policy, there would no longer be any members enrolled in, in base silver plans or um, the 73% AV silver CSR variant because people in those plans would be better off purchasing a gold plan and that's what they would do. Um, on the other hand, Texas, which is another state that uh, kind of set a CSR load, didn't make that assumption. They used total statewide enrollment distribution in the previous year to calculate the load, which is why it's lower. Um, like Texas, we didn't feel comfortable assuming that people would necessarily behave rationally and move out of the lower AV silver plans into a gold plan. If that does happen over time, um, the load should increase and premium tax credit should increase as well. Um, but I think we've seen with the reflective silver issue here in Vermont that people don't always behave rationally and we just, we weren't comfortable doing that. So um, I'm not an actuary and I'm getting beyond my expertise here, but uh, I, I think you should adopt the policy. I'm recommending that you adopt the policy and I wanted to thank the HCA for uh, raising the issue. Um, I was on the fence for some time about this. Um, it, it feels pretty uncomfortable to do something that is at odds with a position taken by the American Academy of Actuaries. Um, but just personally, it also seems like an area where reasonable actuaries can disagree and do disagree. Um, what's reflected in the draft policy is less aggressive than what New Mexico and Texas have done, but I think it's more justified and really focused on the rating rules and how those are applied. We have a long history here in Vermont of community rating and equity and fairness are part of our standard of review for these plans. I think the policy is arguably a more equitable and fair way to price plans, and obviously it will help make rates more affordable uh, for a substantial number of people, which is also another aspect of our standard of review and our statutory purpose. So um, so I guess that's that's where I am on on this. Um, unfortunately, we don't have Eleni on the line this afternoon, but I'm happy to try and answer any questions you have about the policy or the, the issues. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Great, thank you, Mr. Barber. Um, I have a couple of small comments that I'll share, but I'll hear from the other board members first. Um, if anyone would like to go ahead, please, please go ahead. I'll go ahead. Um, I'm supportive of the Policy is recommended by our general counsel. I think it does a good job of moving the ball forward on affordability while balancing um, balancing data driven uh, decision making. So I'm supportive of it. Yeah, I too am supportive of the uh, recommendation. I I I think the math is complicated and sometimes looks um, unintuitive. I really appreciate uh, being led through it so clearly by l and &E. um, I think it's the right thing for us to do. I think it'll help help for monitors. I'm also supportive. I think it's a step in the right direction. <clears throat> and I appreciate, Mike, your, your um, excellent work on this and helping, uh, helping me understand the issues better and uh, LNE's contribution as well. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to this. I support this as well. I appreciated the presentation last week. I appreciated your comments, Mike, and your thoughtfulness in helping us navigate this actuarial territory. And I agree that, you know, this seems to be an area where responsible actuaries can disagree. And if we can weigh on the side of helping Vermonters uh, allow 
them to get more uh, subsidies, I think we should do that. And so I'm supportive of this draft policy as well. Thank you for you know your thoughts and uh, your analysis on this. Um, I'm in alignment with my fellow board members and I support this. Um, two quick notes that I did have. Um, one, I wanna make sure we're thinking about consumer awareness of the advantages of this change. Um, because it's it's true that sometimes consumers don't act rational or don't have the information to make these decisions. So I just want to put a plug out there for um, consumer awareness uh, of this change because it does make a difference. Um, I'd also flag that there is at least a potential for increase in total cost of care through increased utilization. Um, but for me, ultimately, that's not a bad thing. Um, people need utilization, they need to see the doctor, and if they can better afford it through this change in policy, it's a step the board can make towards affordability. I also support it. So um, I was on the fence and I appreciate, Mike, um, your work and l &E's helping us understand these issues really thoroughly because it was complex for me to understand. So thanks for doing it. Um, with that, I'll turn it to the healthcare advocate. Thanks so much, Chair Foster. Um, and thank you, Mr. Barber, for all your work on this. Um, I agree with what board members have said. I think this is a step in the right direction. Um, I mean, I think it's probably just no surprise that we do think that in the future, the board can take a step and go further. Just a few kind of notes for context. What, what New Mexico did was require consistent and rigorous adherence to the Affordable Care Act insurance rating rules that were approved by CMS. And I think folks have alluded to this, but the New Mexico state regulator was advised, also advised by actuaries, and they carried out the policy change informed by their guidance and recommendations. So all actuaries do not agree that their approach is unsound. Um, put simply, I think this approach really, I mean, it has been replicated and adapted in other states. It's really a corrective measure to ensure compliance with the ACA in a lot of ways. Um, but I think most importantly, it's it's good to focus on and important to focus on what actually happened in New Mexico when they adopted the approach. The sky didn't fall for insurers financially. In fact, in 2021, health insurance collected $300 million more in premium payments compared to 2020. Obviously, New Mexico is a bigger state, but this continues an increasing trend that was uninterrupted from 2013 to 2021. So that's before and during the regulatory change. And insurers aligned with the guidance due to clear and consistent rules that were applied by the regulators. So they held firm on it, and then the insurers came into line. But I think most importantly is that the number of customers and consumers in high deductible coverage in bronze and other silver plans that decreased by half, which is huge. Um, and this significantly decreased out-of-pocket costs for folks, which is arguably the most important to Vermonters to, and to consumers, and is one of the more kind of tangible kitchen table metrics that we have in health policy. I mean, this is a weedsy area for sure. Um, and I, I wanna applaud the board for, I mean, I think given how complex and fragmented our healthcare system is, this is a rare, un unfortunately rare, but it's a good thing that we have an opportunity to do some real good here. Um, and I think the board can really directly help consumers if you decide to adopt this policy. Um, and I think really you're weighing a low likelihood of potentially uh, unsoundness in the market that has not been seen in other markets and other states that have adopted this versus the certainty that this would help a lot of Vermonters. So thank you for the consideration and uh, hope that the measure has your support. Thank you, Mr. Price. Those are really salient points. I appreciate you sharing those. Um, <clears throat> I'll turn it to uh, the public for public comment. Um, just use the raise your hand function and I'll call on folks. Um, Walter, how are you? Please go ahead. Hey, hey Owen, buried in snow here right now. How are you doing? <laughs> uh, I'm okay, uh, if I, I was just... in Montpelier, I could shovel, but I'm here, I'm up in yeah. Jericho. Oh, well. Montpelier is not too bad, about five to six inches. Um, I do. I back up the board, the members in the act. I just wanted to wonder, how does one define affordability? Because that's different for various people. And what is rationality? And 
those are the two questions I had. Another observation is that Wendell Potter called the Affordable Care Act the Private Insurance Self-Preservation Act. So it's not surprising when the advocates said that they profited so much in the last couple of years. That's it. Great. Thank you. Um, any other um, public comment? Mike, do you have the draft policy able to be um, shared? Yes, let me just. Uh, yeah. Are you able to see that? Yes. Um, I, I move to uh, adopt the draft policy as displayed um, by Mr. Barber. I'll second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, the motion carries and the draft policy is hereby adopted. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Barber, for your work on this and to the Healthcare Advocates Office. Thank you. Um, next, uh, Sarah Lindbergh um, will present on our fiscal year 24 hospital budget um, draft guidance. Um, Ms. Lindbergh. I think you're on um, mute still. Are you able to see the slides? <laughs> yes. Yep. <laughs> Wonderful. And now you can hear me all as well. Uh, Sarah Lindbergh, uh, Director of Health Systems Finance here to introduce the proposed draft guidance for fiscal year uh, 24 hospital budgets. There's a lot of material here, uh, so we'll get through what we can. As always, if you require clarification or me to slow down, please speak up. Um, so the agenda today will be um, just start to review kind of the landscape um, that faces uh, the interested parties in this decision making process and then go over um, our general kind of overview of the approach for fiscal year 24, walk through some of the budgetary factors and benchmarks that staff recommend and uh, briefly discuss some of the planned analyses that staff uh, intend to um, prepare uh, for these budgets when they come in. So uh, the hospital sector in the United States uh, is in very, very dire straits. Um, I, I, you know, just anecdotally, I don't think that it probably has been this bad in most of our working lifetimes. Um, some evidence of that is that um, about half of hospitals in the U.S. ended the um, year, uh, uh, calendar year 2022 in the red. All three of the credit rating agencies, uh, Moody's, Standard & Poor, and um, the other one, Fitch, um, have degraded uh, this or otherwise considered it a negative or deteriorating outlook uh, facing this industry. And while you know very early signs in 23 are encouraging, uh, at least over um, calendar year 22, we're still uh, much uh, below uh, where we were or where hospitals had been prior to the pandemic. So I think that the financial hardship out there is real. It's not just in Vermont, and that uh, it's an important factor as we think about um, regulating hospitals uh, in the current environment. Um, some of the headwinds uh, facing hospitals, not just in Vermont, but um, in the U.S., uh, workforce problems. So there's an increasing reliance on contractual labor, and those uh, positions also are uh, still have significantly higher rates than hospitals had been used to prior to the pandemic. Uh, increasing employment vacancies uh, in, the, in a very highly competitive labor market. And there are exits from the healthcare workforce due to retirements and burnout. Um, so we've heard testimony about some of the working conditions facing providers and, and how difficult that can be to manage. 
Um, other expense growth, this isn't unique to hospitals by any means. Consumers are also facing uh, these pressures on you know, the cost of supplies, insurance, utilities, eggs. Have you seen eggs? <laughs> Uh, pharmaceutical costs are rising incredibly, um, you know, and also the advent of new prescriptions that are um, high unit costs are starting to roll out. Um, and then capacity constraints, and these um, feel particularly acute in Vermont, where our patients are staying longer than historically, and that um, post-acute placements are outpacing the availability. So people are in a uh, beds that they normally wouldn't be taking up because there's nowhere for them to transfer to and they cannot be safely discharged. Um, this often has an impact on hospital finance because they may not be able to recoup um, reimbursements uh, if the state has outpaced uh, the benefit limit. Um, we also um, are experiencing um, troubling uh, ED boarding uh, where patients uh, need to hang out there until there's an available bed. Uh, there was recently a Supreme Court case in New Hampshire um, talking about that practice, and I know that's an area that concerns all our hospitals. Um, for some Vermont-specific data, um, this uh, is uh, borrowed, <laughs> attributed to the economic forecast uh, for the state of Vermont. The left-hand growth is just indexing uh, employment in the state to 20, uh, I'm sorry, February of 2020, so right before the pandemic hit, and where that relative um, employment stands today. So total em employment is about 96% uh, of where it was back in February of 2020, but you can see that um, healthcare and social um, assistance is uh, much lower than that, uh, right around 93% uh, of where it was back in February of 2020. So the loss of workforce in Vermont is uh, particularly acute in this industry, only outpaced by leisure and hospitality. Um, and on the right-hand side, this is a measure of how many um, open vacancies they are per unemployed individual. And so Vermont's is more than double national. So we have a lot more vacancies per in unemployed individual. So it's a highly um, constrained market. Um, and, you know, anecdotally, you know, even, you know, kind of positions that would be a breeze to fill are standing vacant for a long time. Uh, and that's not unique to hospitals. <laughs> However, uh, the requirements, particularly for the skilled workforce there, are obviously uh, might exacerbate some of these issues here in Vermont. Um, and here, what I have is um, comparing Vermont to US over time. Um, this is the median bit of margin. So you can kind of think of that like a total margin, um, but in a way that um, tends to uh, focus on uh, the way they're uh, evaluated, particularly for borrowing. Um, and you can see that over time, um, Vermont's hospitals have demonstrated leaner margins uh, than the United States uh, for both our acute care and our critical access hospitals. Uh, but you can also see the nosedive that we will be expecting to see in the cost reports when they start coming out for fiscal year uh, 22. Um, so, you know, since uh, 2011, uh, this is the lowest uh, margin that our hospitals have seen um, for acute care. And it looks like we're going right back to kind of the trend that we were seeing for our critical access hospitals um, prior to the COVID infusion of um, dollars. And that, that's what those upward trends are from 2020 is um, money from the government to help um, keep hospitals open uh, during the decrease in utilization. So it's uh, not driven by net um, <clears throat> patient revenue uh, in the way we would historically think about that. Now, um, on the other side of the coin, consumers aren't having it uh, easy either. So this is looking at the growth in personal health care expenditures um, from 2000 to 2021. Um, as you can see, um, in aggregate, that's grown by 263% um, since the year 2000. And the ones associated with hospitals and uh, have increased by a similar uh, amount, uh, as well as the professional services. So if you look at the hospital care, and the professional services associated with physicians and clinical care, that's 62% of personal, personal health care um, expenditures. So while um, hospitals and hospital expenditures aren't the only thing driving up these values, they certainly are a significant part of it. So it's an important piece of that side of the coin. And when we look at kind of trying to gauge the affordability of consumers, this graph from Kaiser, uh, the Kaiser Foundation shows 
um, what family premiums have changed, how family premiums have changed relative to workers' earnings and overall inflation. And as you can see, while the premium growth has gotten closer to earnings in recent years, uh, that that it's hard to make up for all that lost time in earlier years, but also that for the first time, um, well, in recent history, um, of, you know, just general inflation is greatly outpacing workers' earnings. So, all that to say that there's a you know a lot of economic pressure on consumers as well. Um, and not only individual patients, um, but also employers. Um, so this data comes from the uh, medical expenditure panel survey, and it's showing how premiums have grown um, from 20 2011 to 2021. Um, and so the table shows the, the current dollars and then an adjusted amount to show kind of what the growth over inflation has been. Um, so in Vermont, uh, again, after you adjust for inflation, uh, the average annual premium for a uh, single employee has grown by 21% compared to 19% annually. Um, however, unlike observed nationally, uh, employers here in Vermont appear to not be passing on some of that increased premium growth to their employees. And so the growth um, in the employee share has been the same here in Vermont, whereas more, it has grown at a higher rate nationally. So um, the growth has been 27% uh, of the employee share nationally. And so that you know affects employers, and therefore it, uh, affects what they need to charge for their goods and services. And so we're kind of in a economic spiral here of inflation, uh, cost inflation that uh, makes this all very complex. Um, thanks to the healthcare advocate, so to provide some more context about medical debt and the challenges that's causing for Vermont residents. Um, so they cite here the uh, 2021 Vermont Household Health Insurance Survey, where 44% um, of pri privately insured Vermonters um, were found to be underinsured. Um, so that's driven by a calculation of how their income compares with their health care expenses. Um, and that's in addition to the approximately 3% who were estimated to be uninsured at that time. Um, and they uh, embarked on a project to get some more um, uh, qualitative information about medical debt. And so they conducted a survey and found that medical debt affects all Vermonters, not confined to certain age groups, income levels, or insurance types. This is, this is a problem across the board. And um, that Vermonters also reported that they trust their providers and really want to pay back that debt but they just feel that they can't uh, due to their financial means, uh, makes that prohibitive. Um, and that it might lead to Vermonters avoiding to get care that they might need or recommended by their provider because of that fear of incurring expenses that they cannot pay. Uh, and then, you know, this I think is uh, maybe not directly from the mouths of the survey, but a uh, fair, fair uh, assumption here, but that uh, medical debt and the lack of consumer affordability does challenge the goals of the triple aim, which is, you know, great access, wonderful quality at an affordable cost or uh, containing the cost. Um, and so they included a few um, quotes from that uh, directly, and you can see here the words from actual Vermonters. So an 18 to 26 year old uh, insured uh, person from Orange, Vermont said, I have taken money from savings and I'm currently working four jobs to pay off medical debt. It's embarrassing to ask for help and to know that you are unable to pay your bills, yet be told that you make too much money for help. Uh, a 27 to 40 year old uninsured resident of Orleans said, my medical debt is the biggest challenge in my life right now and I wanna get rid of it as soon as possible. I have to do more, it scares me because the increase in debt is incalculable, but I have to ensure the health of my family. Uh, I, someone from Chittenden who's insured in the 41 to 60 year old demographic said, we worry a lot if we will die sooner than we would if we could have had preventative medical care. I think um, I remember an anecdote that Dr. Merman shared um, at a meeting uh, related to that, that kind of real toll that that might have. Uh, an insured resident of Chittenden uh, who is 18 to 26 said, the dang medical debt made on my credit score made it hard for me to secure housing and left me homeless for a period of time during COVID-19. 
And finally, uh, they included a quote from a resident of Windsor who's insured in the 27 to 40 year old uh, age demographic saying medical debt impacts my life. No food, no internet for school, no car insurance, the list goes on. Especially as a college student that worked full time, you have to choose between the collections calls or getting food. So just putting some context around these decisions and, you know, it's, it affects a lot of people in a lot of different ways. And, you know, we want to be balanced in thinking through that. Um, so kind of turning back to the business at hand with that context in mind, uh, we're in the, we're currently looking to review and update the historical methods that we've used to regulate hospital budgets. And this current 24 cycle is really intended as a bridge year uh, between the way we use, we have historically done things and the processes we're hoping to start rolling out next year for fiscal year 25. And the goal, uh, and, and I'm very earnest here, is really to just start some significant conversations about uh, expense growth and uh, how that looks and understand it better. Um, but this would mean turning away from caps on net patient revenue to looking more at evidence-based approaches um, about hospital expenses. Uh, it's also designed to respond to feedback. Um, so Mathematica policy research conducted interviews with you all, um, as well as the healthcare advocate in almost all of the chief financial officers at Vermont's hospitals uh, to get some feedback about what we've been doing. And some suggested improvements include using consistent evidence-based key performance indicators to guide decision-making, specifying a standard framework that incorporates appropriate benchmarks, uh, increasing the efficiency of the process and reducing administrative burden on the regulated entities. I think the first part of that is more uh, for staff uh, serving the board <laughs> and making sure that our processes are more efficient for your uh, your purposes. Um, and also, you know, like all things, treat everybody the same, but also treat them as their special circumstance. So how can we kind of consider tailors uh, tailor some of aspects of these processes based on hospital characteristics, such as how they're paid by Medicare, the resources they have, their corporate structure, the patient populations that they serve. And so uh, we're not going to solve all that this year, but um, that's part of um, where some of these recommendations come from. Um, here's my cursor. There it is. Um, and so just a word on trying to align with other payment reform activities. Um, so again, we're trying to understand the changes in budgeted revenue that are driven by hospitals' expenses. So anytime you're trying to create some sort of fixed budget, you're going to want to know what needs to happen on the revenue and the expense side. So I think that we've spent a lot of years here at the Greenmount Care Board and before the Green Mountain Care Board focusing on revenue, and maybe it's time to turn our attention uh, more to the expense side of this. Um, and that, I think, will really well position us in thinking through some important considerations for developing some of those payment mechanisms and models. Um, but all that to say that uh, we're tracking all of this and doing our best to make sure that all that uh, effort is aligned um, and that we uh, are all rowing in the same direction. Uh, so as I previously mentioned, uh, instead of relying on an overall cap on net patient revenue growth, we are recommending thresholds for expense growth um, based on publicly available data. Uh, we also recommend, you know, basing budgets and their decisions on um, fiscal year 22 actuals um, versus the approved budgets in fiscal year 23. So we think that this will make some um, historical problems, especially given the high amount of uncertainty, um, a little bit more direct in uh, kind of understanding what's going on. Um, so plenty of work in progress. <laughs> this is uh, not, to meant, not meant to be exhaustive, but some uh, important issues that we're, you know, going to continue to work on in preparation for fiscal year 25 is um, quality. Um, so we are going to continue to, or we recommend that we continue to help develop the hospital quality framework um, and thinking about how to monitor, monitor that across the delivery system. And of course, think about ways to incorporate that in the um, performance of hospitals as part of the budget regulation. Um, productivity, that's one that, um, <laughs> That, that's very difficult to measure, and we're, we need to do a lot of work to try to figure out some accurate and evidence-based metrics for this. And so there's a lot of work to do on that front. 
Um, patient access is another um, area where uh, we will include a, a, a measure related to patient access in this year's guidance, but we are looking for a broader look at access. So by confining the thinking of access just to hospital budgets, we're only going to see people who showed up. And I think that might be giving it short shrift. So I'm also interested in people who aren't seeking care at all. And I, I would recommend considering partnering with another organization to help us get um, better information on that longer term. Um, equity is a critical issue. Uh, we are seeing a lot of movement in metrics in this area that is already on the docket for the um, hospital quality framework, um, but we think that we should start standing up these measures and monitoring them, but thinking about how to incorporate them in, in hospital budgets is going to require a little bit more time to think through. Um, as far as consumer affordability, so unlike rate review, this is not an explicit criteria in a hospital budget review process. Uh, however, it's obviously one of the core principles for why the GMCB was um, created. And so I think determining how it fits into this process also requires some, some work. But um, affordability, in my mind, is, is much bigger than just a hospital budget. Um, and so I think we just want to make sure that we're not uh, short-sighted in figuring out how to incorporate that in an accountable way. Uh, in the per capita budgeting, uh, as required by statute, so uh, because this is so likely to be so entrenched in kind of some of the conversations on uh, payment delivery reform, we also think that this just needs some more time to make sure it's aligned before um, implementing it in fiscal year 24, but it's certainly something that we will be tracking and developing uh, in preparation for 25. So, uh, <laughs> After this guidance is approved, we're just going to keep working towards 25 guidance, <laughs> which will be hard to keep ourselves disciplined about what the rules of engagement will be for each of those processes, but I'll be here to remind us. Um, so again, overall approach, budgetary assumption, thresholds that we establish in guidance. Here's an important philosophical point for the board. Um, so if we do follow this recommended approach, the board needs to determine what it would do if a budget comes in under those thresholds. Uh, would it not tinker? Would it have something to say? And I think that um, whatever that decision is, it needs to be clearly articulated in the guidance so that hospitals have a chance to understand um, what to expect. Uh, however, uh, I don't think that these uh, thresholds should be limiting and that if hospitals use different factors that they should provide evidence in their narrative and help the board consider um, how to uh, incorporate or uh, consider those alternate um, parameters in the proposed budgets. Uh, and then as I uh, alluded to earlier, we will have a whole boatload of planned analyses that we will be ready to launch uh, as soon as the budgets come in. So the board can expect to have a lot more in their toolkit um, before uh, the hospitals start uh, talking with us for hearings and deliberations. All right, so budgetary factors. So again, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list, but this is a, a encapsulation of things where budgets historically have missed or are educated guesses about what will be most material to the budgets in fiscal year 24. Um, so the recommended uh, parameters would be for labor, utilization, uh, pharmaceutical costs, cost inflation, uh, commercial price, uh, financial benchmarks, uh, known pricing changes uh, for our governmental payers, Medicare and Medicaid, uncompensated care, and uh, up for debate if there's uh, anything else that we think would be important to uh, potentially include here. Uh, so, we ready to get into it? I am. <laughs> All right, labor. So labor is obviously a huge factor in these budgets. And uh, for those of you that were here last year, uh, that was actually flagged by The Economist that um, it appeared, at least based on 2012 data, that labor was an even more share of the input cost for Vermont hospitals than seen nationally. And so um, that likely is a testament to relatively smaller hospitals and the fixed costs associated with those. But um, as we can see, this is comparing how um, the cost for salaried uh, 
benefits and uh, wages uh, for Vermont hospitals have compared to the Bureau of Labor Statistics Employment Cost Index. So this uh, ECI is one of the measures that the economists recommended about you know, the cost that employers face uh, to employ folks, and it is broken out by sector. Um, so this one is specifically for the hospital sector, which I didn't flag, I, I apologize about that. Um, but as you can see, uh, over this time, the, the employer cost index uh, had an average of 7%, ranging from 3.3 to 14.4%, and a standard deviation of 3.2. Um, and uh, I will flag that that 15% growth from 21 to 22 for Vermont, or I'm sorry, from 20 to 22 for Vermont, um, is estimated. Uh, we're still missing a little bit of FTE data, um, as you'll see on a, a, a upcoming slide. Um, but since uh, the pandemic hit, uh, Vermont's uh, actual compensation for their staff has increased more than has been observed in employer costs nationally. Uh, part of that may be catch up since Vermont tends to have lower wages and we can certainly provide more analysis about that if it would be helpful, but I do think it m likely won't change the outcome that this is the probably best benchmark that we came across for this. Um, so the recommendation we have is to set a target of no more than 13.4% growth, which is the average of the two-year growth rate plus two standard deviations, uh, noting that that's a per FTE salary and benefit expense. Um, there's a lot of volatility here, and there's also a lot of motivation by our hospitals to reduce their reliance on contractual labor. So part of the reason for uh, you know suggesting a rather high benchmark is uh, to factor in um, you know the hope that increasing compensation at our hospitals would help support the reduced reliance on contractual labor. Um, so here is how that threshold would have performed over time uh, for past fiscal years. So up until um, 2020, almost everyone would have been below this benchmark, um, a little bit more challenging since then due to the aforementioned uh, challenges. Uh, that, again, that fiscal year 22 round circle is not true. It's probably more like here. As you can see, it tends to be right in the middle of the dots as you would expect for an average. So um, so that's probably more like uh, just above this threshold. Um, an alternative benchmark for labor uh, would be looking at uh, trends in the for direct patient care and the Medicare cost reports. Uh, the trade-off for this is that this information is only for um, prospective payment hospitals. Critical access hospitals do not report this on their cost reports. Um, but here you can see how that measure, again, in two-year growth rates is compared um, from national New England and Vermont. And again, we see um, particularly in the last two years in this series that Vermont wage growth has outpaced um, national and New England. Uh, and we also see the incredible growth in the contracted labor um, from 2019 to 2021 at 143 that percent. That's labor. Utilization. So this is an area where we're we need some serious work on data. And so we don't have great data uh, in this area. Uh, we think that the best data we have is what hospitals report to us. It's the most comprehensive and current. Uh, however, it also just um, is hard to kind of validate. And so, you know, we would offer um, regulated uh, hospitals a chance to help us get that data right um, if they want to invest the time to improve that. Um, but it is a very noisy data set, no matter how you measure it. Um, and so thanks to Mathematica policy research, this was a method that was um, suggested, um, again, just in this bridge year as we try to improve the data available to us. Um, but essentially, you take your gross inpatient revenue, so that is reflecting utilization. Remember, we haven't factored in any differences in payment arrangements or uh, cost coverage or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and we get the average charge per admission. 
And then we use that value to scale um, for each of these areas, which is how we historically have had gross revenue reported. So the inpatient, outpatient, chronic care slash skilled nursing facility, swing beds, and physician. Uh, note that this would assume that any case mix intensity changes are uh, the same across those domains. Uh, I'm not saying that that's a great assumption, but it might be the one we're stuck with given, again, data constraints. And <laughs> this, I, I don't mean to chuckle, it's just like this is very noisy data. And so here um, for each of those domains, you can see what the system-wide change in utilization looked like over time what the median was uh, among our hospitals. And then that last line is called the interquartile range. So that's the distribution of the middle 50% of your data. So what is, how far apart is the 25th and 50th percentile of that um, data set? And as you can see, there's very high numbers, um, again, speaking to the volatility in this data set. Um, but you can also see that, you know, system-wide, we're seeing a lot of negative numbers, um, you know, indicating utilization drops um, in our system. Um, and so that, you know, that was true in the raw numbers I was looking at. It's not going to be true for every hospital. Um, but all that to say, given the data constraints and how messy this all is, um, you know, I turn to the National Healthcare Projections, which uh, CMS uh, occasionally publishes, uh, and they have just published something showing that their accuracy hasn't been too bad nationally. Now, Vermont might be a different story, uh, but they think that um, the height demand in 22 will start to normalize in 23 and 24 and then start to slow um, from 2025 to 2030. Uh, they do expect utilization to remain especially high in, for private health insurance, though they do think that the 23 and 24 uh, utilization levels are likely to be close to what we're experiencing in 21 and 22 or what we did experience. So all that to say, uh, you know, I think there's different ways to do this, but it might be wise to consider a conservative threshold in utilization and ask hospitals to provide their analysis of why that might be greater. Um, this is an area that's notoriously difficult to predict. Um, and so I think if nothing else, uh, staff would benefit from learning more about how hospitals approach this uh, vaccine uh, calculation. So utilization. Other factors that influence utilization, I'm in DL, sorry, um, but patient behavior. So people might choose to go different places. Uh, they might not, they might not feel like they have a choice and not go at all. Uh, one significant factor that we are sure will hit this year is that the end of the federal public health emergency will mean that the Medicaid benefit uh, redeterminations will uh, occur, which will affect the market. Um, it remains to be seen how many of those uh, will migrate to the exchange, which uh, offers uh, higher reimbursements for hospitals, um, but we also might see an, an increase in uninsured Vermonters, which would be an increase, uh, you would expect higher increases in uh, bad debt and charity care or free care. Uh, you also will see demographic changes. So as Vermonters move or move their um, care relationships and age, uh, that might have an influence on utilization, particularly the type and intensity of the utilization. Service offerings may change. That would certainly affect utilization as would staffing levels. So if you are down a surgeon or two, that can materially affect your utilization. So um, because these uh, are very difficult and very regional, uh, staff recommend that hospitals uh, use that type of information to um, help us understand their utilization assumptions uh, versus being prescriptive about any of those particular variables. Pharmaceutical costs. So that this is one of the highest growing categories in health expenditures. You can see where it's projected to grow again, according to the CMS national health expenditure data. So um, if for 2020, it was about $350 billion, uh, which is projected to get more like $550 billion by 2030. So um, it's a significant driver, not just for hospitals. Um, this also translates to consumers uh, through either premiums or out-of-pocket costs. So, you know, it's a major area of concern and one I think that is uh, starting to get more and more federal attention and try to address. There are 
provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act uh, related to negotiating prices with Medicare, and also um, when pharmaceutical costs exceed inflation, uh, that includes a provision that, that that kind of excess profit would be returned to Medicare. So it'll be interesting to see um, if that has any disruptions to this uh, market, if we want to call it that. This one's tricky. I'm not gonna get. I'm not gonna joke here. So it, this is one of those things where, depending on where you measure the spend or how this is incorporated in a hospital's um, infrastructure, can vary quite a bit. Um, they, you know, oftentimes hospitals are both purchasers and suppliers of prescription medication, which is not in non-prescription medication for that matter. Um, and the way that we currently collect data does not give us a lot of insight into that. So, you know, as we start talking about really revising our data model for 25, I think that's one that needs special attention so we can get um, a better handle on that. We also are seeing uh, more and more high cost drugs um, that is very difficult um, to manage for payers, for hospitals, for patients in trying to balance their healthcare needs with these expenses. Um, uh, I also think that, you know, the 340B program is is something that is uh, getting scrutiny uh, federally and historically or in recent years has uh, helped buttress uh, the uh, other operating revenue uh, that are um, some hospitals rely on. Um, so I think that's also another big uncertainty that it's hard for us to predict uh, today. Um, I also think that these are likely to be material to budgets in fiscal year 24, um, and we need to bear in mind that these, in aggregate, these uh, expenses are going to go up not just for price, but also kind of the mix of pharmaceuticals they're purchasing and also how many that are being prescribed. Um, so again, I think this needs a lot more work um, for us to do a better job of getting our arms wrapped around. But for 24, I would recommend the producer price index for prescription drugs, um, which, as you can see, has uh, leveled out to right around 4% uh, since uh, 2020. Um, and so when you actually average it out, it comes up to 4.4%. Again, that would be a threshold I recommend for uh, changes associated with price uh, in pharmaceutical costs. And if there's other changes that hospitals kind of untangle that for us. Okay, cost inflation. So when I say cost inflation here, I'm really talking about um, the ones that we all experience as consumers for the purchase of services and goods. Um, I'm not, we've already kind of addressed employment growth. We've addressed utilization. This is meant to be kind of a traditional economic or economist's uh, definition. Um, and here I think it's fairly clear um, based on what the economists uh, propose, but that the producer price index probably is the best bet here to try to get a handle on that. Um, and here uh, we recommend a threshold of 6%. Again, that's just the um, simple average from 2020 to 2022 there. Um, hard to say where where that's going. Um, you know, I think most people think it, it it's likely to dampen, but how fast and how soon that might hit the hospitals is a different story. Uh, they tend to be lagged. They tend to get the inflation a bit later. Commercial price. This is one where data is maybe the least helpful. Um, this is really more of a policy kind of consideration in my judgment, but um, I can tell you that um, for Medicare, so this is how they think about inflation. So if you look at the cumulative growth from 22 to 24, as forecasted uh, by the Office of the Actuary, uh, Medicare is predicting a 13% growth rate. Uh, and then for the offices of physicians, uh, just under 12%. So pretty substantial increases. Um, again, this is going to be more holistic than just price, um, but you know, always good to kind of check uh, other criteria. Um, and so one uh, area that I uh, think is helpful to understand the relative uh, commercial prices here in Vermont is uh, the RAND Hospital Transparency Study. Um, and what I've done here in so many numbers uh, that I know will take some time to digest, but this is uh, four different areas, or I'm sorry, 
three different areas, but uh, two different looks for inpatient and outpatient care. So relative price uh, is going to be how much did they did uh, these facilities uh, get over what Medicare would have paid? So that's that reference based pricing. So um, so that looks like Brattleboro's uh, outpatient relative price is 325 percent, whereas Copley's is 148 percent. So that is a, the amount above Medicare. Z-score, as I'm sure is somewhere buried in your statistical intro classes from days before, is measuring how many standard deviations away from the mean uh, that value is. So this is saying uh, up or down, how does that compare to the rest of the data in this data set? Now, it doesn't say if that value is right, it just says relatively where these values lie. And so for the um, relative Medicare reference-based price, uh, we don't see anyone, you know, one standard deviation, uh, more than one standard deviation away from the mean, but Copley does stand out as uh, at minus 0.99, as does Mount Escutney. Um, and then for a standardized price per outpatient service, what Rand did there is I said, okay, here's what they did. Here's, we're going to try to make it apples to apples by using Medicare relative weights and figure out how much they got for each service based on that standardized unit of service. And so this is going it, to, it's sometimes shocking because you can see a, uh, that the, the standardized price and the relative price don't always even act in the same direction. So um, there are two different ways to kind of think about this. Um, but here we do see that um, North Country is just over one standard deviation above the mean uh, per outpatient service at 477%. Um, and uh, everyone else, you know, is within that first standard deviation. Uh, when we turn to inpatient, uh, we see that Mount Escutney at 94% of Medicare um, is at negative 1.46, so significantly below. And we see that Porter is also, uh, Porter and Springfield are also more than one standard deviation below um, the relative inpatient Medicare reference based price in this data set. Uh, and then for that standardized price, uh, I was actually surprised to see how close uh, to the average uh, most of our hospitals looked, uh, despite the huge uh, variation in the standardized price per inpatient stay. Um, and so that tells me that there's a ton of variation in this data set. <laughs> um, so again, it's, you know, relatively we're there, but there's just a lot of vari variability. Um, and then finally, the last column is just that relative price uh, based on Medicare. It, it's uh, very difficult, if possible at all, to get a kind of standard unit for professional services. There, there are a few things you could try, but here we just have, again, compared to Medicare, what, um, what was the reimbursement like for, for private? And here, Mount Escutney shows us uh, one and a half times above, uh, one and a half standard deviations above the average of this data set. Um, and the University of Vermont is at uh, 1.46. So on, uh, again, about one and a half standard deviations above the mean. Um, I don't know how helpful that is. I'm open to ideas about other things we can look at. I think that this is uh, one of the um, areas of work uh, that that's, uh, needs a lot of attention. And it's uh, also one that uh, can be a little bit difficult to get uh, data in. Um, and so, you know, I, I welcome thoughts and ideas about other options for a threshold here. But I think ultimately, um, Again, I'm not sure uh, how much the data is going to help guide that um, policy decision. Uh, so as far as key performance indicators, um, we think that uh, look, tracking operating margin, operating a bit of margin, um, still specifying which debt service coverage ratios, days cash on hand and average date of plant does feel like kind of a good set of indicators to measure. Uh, to assess financial health, but where staff are still working is figuring out some standard thresholds. Uh, there is a lot of evidence for relative value. So how are we doing compared to others? We're not seeing a lot of kind of uh, well-researched evidence for what those 
should be. And so we we saw some homework there to report back. Uh, the University of Vermont in their letter um, suggested using a blend from the rating agencies. And so we will certainly provide that as one uh, option. Uh, obviously, that's going to be geared towards your creditworthiness or borrowing ability to borrow. So it might not be the most sensical way to think about this necessarily, but it's uh, certainly an option that we will be presenting to you as we finish compiling um, some uh, some things for you to consider. Uh, oops. Where am I? Okay, pricing changes. So as always, we will be tracking and keeping you apprised of information as it develops related to Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement. Um, but I think what the board needs to think about is how, if and how that late breaking information would be um, accounted for in their review of budgets in August. So is that something we should have a process to, to apply as it becomes known? Is it something that you're going to want to do conditionally? Um, whatever that answer might be, I think just needs to be communicated and codified in the guidance um, so there aren't any surprises at the 11th hour related to that. Um, uncompensated care. Um, so this um, this is a area that's going to be again highly sensitive to the redetermination assumptions. Um, and here, the kind of policy or, or decision point for you is a suggestion from the healthcare advocate that we look at the ratio of bad debt and, free, and charity care or free care. Um, and think about um, if and how that might be codified in guidance, or if that's, again, something that we want to um, put on the docket for more research uh, as we go into fiscal year 25. Um, you know, it's been, you know, it might be one way to think about billing efficiency or other kind of measures. Um, however, I do think, you know, given conversations that this is largely estimated as a proportion of expected revenue um, and maybe isn't thought of in that way. So, the trade-offs, uh, like most things. Um, and then anything else? So again, we didn't need to be exhaustive here, um, but if there are other factors that uh, would help a certain the hospital tell its story, I think we would welcome hearing about that in the narrative, but we think that um, we've kind of captured in these uh, recommended uh, areas the lion's share of things that would affect uh, the proposed budgets coming in. Uh, and then, wow. Staff analysis, this one <laughs> got a lot of work to do. Uh, so these are the analyses that we're, we're going to be rolling out, um, and we'll be socializing this uh, prior to July 1st. The intent is to make sure that we refine our methods, validate the information, that there aren't any surprises in what we're looking at. But the things that staff will be looking at is regulatory compliance, our filings complete and on time. What is the assessment of financial health? So based on the benchmarks we established in the guidance, how do hospitals look compared to those, both in their current state and in their uh, proposed budgets? Um, how have historical budgets performed? Um, so here we'll see, you know, are there any um, evidence that uh, of, you know, maybe missing the mark on some estimates for certain expense categories or, um, you know, have... How, how well have budgets kind of matched actuals, knowing that for the past few years, most of us get a pass as the world has uh, drastically changed. Um, so similar situated hospitals, this will be new. Um, this is uh, looking at how our hospitals compare with those with similar characteristics in other states. Uh, for here, we will be relying on the Medicare cost report data. Uh, this will be limited in how it can be directly applied, but we also think that it's the best we have if for apples to apples comparisons and that there is a lot of meaningful material in there that um, will be helpful in understanding how our hospitals are performing. And so we'll be looking at things, um, you know, such as uh, how does administrative uh, expenditures compare with uh, clinical expenditures? What is, you know, the case mix adjusted uh, per inpatient discharge look like? Uh, you know, what is uh, some of the for you know there there's limited quality information in there, but you know what about you know the proportion of uh, Medicare deaths that happen? So uh, just some some key comparisons. Um, again, making sure that we are matching hospitals that are similarly situated. Um, cost and reimbursement variation, that's an area where we've done a lot of work over the years. So um, in addition to RAN, there's the Yale Pricing Project, there's the Dartmouth Atlas, 
Um, there is the work that Burns and Associates has done to look at uh, recosting and, and looking at cost coverage uh, based on the Medicare cost report cost methodology. Um, so just kind of looking at how our hospitals compare um, relatively to one another. As far as volume and uh, market share, are we seeing evidence of, of care patterns changing? Um, are there market shares changing? Um, you know, what's market concentration compare uh, like in Vermont with other hospital service areas? Um, also, you know, looking for areas if, uh, of where there might be you know, relatively low volume, um, that would be a place to look for that. Um, and then, you know, other data sources would be consulted to really um, absorb and understand uh, the budgeted as filed, but, you know, they wouldn't be designed, any other data source would be to further the objectives of these analyses, not to kind of introduce uh, new things to measure hospitals on. So I get to stop talking, um, but I want to hear from you. Think about the work that we have to do so that we can get a full draft prepared and out for us to review next week with a reminder that the guidance must be adopted by March 31st. Hey, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I have to make a phone call um, because uh, some after school is canceled. So if we can just take a five minute break that would be great um so we'll come back at like 2 10. thank you well, i have a, I can I, I, start calling I, on you ahead. i was I just can, gonna make a sorry tom you can go uh, ahead all right, here, I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna do it this way. I'm gonna call. Tom, you go first, Robin, you go next, and then we'll go with Jess and Dave. Tom, Robin, Jess, Dave. All right, thank you, Owen, and uh, apologies, Robin. Um, and thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you for all the work, you and your team. Um, Laura, Matthew, uh, Tom, others um, have, have put into this. It's a remarkable project that you've undertaken. And it seems like we've made a lot of progress in a year. Still more to go, but um, good. Um, I think this the the theme that I've heard you talk about is evidence-based regulation, and we need data and more information to be able to do that. And I really appreciate um, what you've done. I think the one piece that has um, come up over and over again in thinking and in conversation with you the the ranges for the guidance that we'll give, I, I think it's fair to expect that in the first few years, um, we'll be refining this. And so there'll be, um, it might take a little while before we are able to nail our acceptable ranges. Um, and I think that that's understandable. Um, I'm really, um, I'm particularly appreciative of the data that you're pulling in from other sources, uh, including the Medicare cost report, being able to look at expense data, um, as well as the uh, pricing variation from RAND and the healthcare pricing project. Um, combining those two things, we get a chance to, to find, to have some clearer insight into um, what the revenue from the prices is being spent on and we haven't had that insight previously. And so I think that that will be particularly helpful. Um, and so I just wanna thank you for all that you've done. I know um, it's been some late nights, long days, um, and I really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Well, um, so I have a process question first, which is, are you, I'm assuming you're looking for some general feedback today. You're not looking for sort of reactions to specific numbers. Is that right? I'm seeing a yes. That is correct. I finally found you. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Um, and are you, it, are you expecting that we'll have numbers to attach to each of these that you indicated? It seemed like maybe no, because there were certain areas where you said, 
you know, there's a lot of uncertainty or we don't have good data. And so what I'm trying to put together is like, like, what are the decision points? Um, what information will we have to make the decision points in addition to what you provide today? And, um, well, let's start there. I think I had one other thought, but let's sure. start there. Yeah, so I would recommend a threshold for each of these areas, uh, knowing that uh, hospitals may have other evidence uh, to put before the board uh, for them to consider uh, other values uh, in these areas. Um, however, this would, I think, help us digest and uh, discuss uh, budgetary needs uh, with the regulated entities in a more tangible way than kind of overall NPR. Um, so I think the decision point um, that I'm particularly interested in is, so if we have this threshold, a hospital is underneath that threshold, we're not tackling where they're starting from, uh, is, what's the board gonna do if they don't like where they're starting from? Um, and I think that that's an important um, due process consideration uh, in this guidance. Got it. So that's in particular what you'd be interested in having us discuss. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, if, and, right. and if there's any areas where it feels lacking or you feel like the, we should do more development, I'm also interested in that feedback at this stage. <laughs> okay. And then when, so then next week you'll come back with more information on sort of recommendations for the threshold range for each of the points. Is that kind of the idea? Yeah, we can break those out um, <laughs> once we're figuring out that we're landing in one place. And also, you know, the industry hasn't had much time to digest sure. this. So we'll also be getting right. feedback from them. Yeah, that would be good. Um, okay. And so the part that uh, I'm struggling with a little bit is, and maybe this is because I'm used to doing it one way, and this is a very different way, is I'm at least used to having a general sense of how my decisions are going to roll up and impact not just each individual hospital, but also the overall statewide trend. So the way I'm, and please correct me if I don't have this right, but what I'm hearing you say is we pick these threshold for different expenses. If they're in, that then rolls up to basically a trend from 22 to 24 and gets converted into a budget which would reflect revenue as well as expenses. Is that right? Yep, that's correct. Okay. Um, so I think that a little bit of the challenge for me with just saying, if the boxes are all checked, I'm good, um, is that in the past, we have had some issues where hospitals have come in with what we were calling aspirational budgets, where they were basically using their expenses to come up with a top line number that they had no possibility of reaching, sort of building in a negative margin automatically. And I don't know how to know that if I'm just picking the expenses. So maybe you can think a little bit about that issue because that was a challenge that we tried to correct over a few years um, with with a number, it, you know, it was more the smaller hospital, critical access hospitals, right? Um, so that's where my head's hurting a little bit <laughs> today. So if you could just, you don't have to respond today, but if you could just sort of think about that a little bit, that would be helpful. Um, for me in terms of trying to put it all together um, between now and August. I do have some other questions, um, but yeah. maybe if other people had thoughts about that, that issue, I, I should pause and we can kind of stick to a topic instead of jumping all over the place. But whatever you'd like to do, Chair Foster. Um, I think just go ahead if you, if you want. All right. Yeah, that's what we're we're here for, and this is helpful to you know, especially the newer newer members and myself. So please go ahead. Okay. Um, okay. So hold on. Could you actually pull the slides back up, please? You betcha. 
<laughs> okay, uh, so certain... yeah, um, if you could go, I think what, what might be helpful for me is to just touch on each of the budgetary factors. I don't have questions for all of them, but it's gonna. I didn't. I didn't do a very good job of writing the slide numbers down in my notes. So, um, so I think I don't think I have any questions on your suggestions around labor on utilization. Um, are so if you could go to utilization. Thank you. Um. So one of the, this is just a thought and you may have already done this in, and it may not really be relevant, but in the individual and small group market, l &E had done some utilization analysis um, because some of the utilization, because some of the mark, some of the plans are too small for them to, for the carrier to have credible experience. And for a number of years, they had kind of come up with a 1% utilization factor. Now, I don't know that that necessarily makes sense because obviously the individual and small group market is only 85,000 people and that's for all medical, not just hospital. But um, I just wanted to raise it as another potential uh, data point that at least some of us are have in the back of our head from prior rate filings. Um, that's where the 2% comes from. So, <laughs> oh, okay, great. Perfect. You're way ahead of me. Thank you. All right. Um, now we should go back to the list or to the next topic, next yep. utilization. Pharmaceutical cost. Yes. Um, so for pharmaceutical cost, if we were to go with the producer price index, then we would be yeah, the recommendation would be good. Okay. Yep. All right. I, I guess I do not have questions about that. I do not have questions about cost inflation. Commercial price. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I need you to walk me through this again. Okay. I, I, I don't think I totally... Maybe it's because I'm sick and not at 100%, but I did not follow... This one? Uh, both, if you okay. want to just do both of them, that would be helpful. And mm -hmm. then I. Yep. So th this is uh, showing the market basket uh, update that Medicare provides, um, yep. which is uh, how they kind of look at um, inpatient inflation. Uh, so again, this is you know designed to be uh, comprehensive some of some of these other factors that we've already covered, um, but just. Uh, noting that uh, the growth um, that they are forecasting related to inflation from the fourth quarter of 22 to 24 is 13%. Uh, and then the Medicare Economic Index is designed to measure the inflationary growth for physician practices, um, and that they're projecting an 11.72% growth rate. So this is um, one kind of index to see how commercial prices uh, are comparing with Medicare. Is it perfect? No. Is it publicly available? Is it forecasted? It's one one thing that uh, I, I'm guessing hospitals look at. And do we know um, specifically for that? So Medicare uses this then to increase their prices. It is a factor. <laughs> a factor. They, they, yeah, okay. they've got a lot of rules and methods and uh, very yeah. granular uh, methods that they use related to price. But this is kind of one of those executive level kind of indicators of how Medicare is okay. growing. Yeah. Great. Um, and then here, uh, so this is looking at uh, the... I think I get the relative price, actually. Like that is straightforward to me. Mm -hmm. um, it, I think I might have... I might have been looking too carefully at the data and missed what you said about standard or standardized sure. price. Yeah, so that's saying this is how much was collected from private plans for the facility. And then it's uh, weighted by trying to make it apples to apples what was provided based on Medicare relative weights. So it's yeah. trying to say like per Medicare standard unit, this is how much they got from commercial. Got it. Thank you. All right. Yeah. I'm good there. Um, okay. Uh, although financial. I guess oh, I guess my question is, will you have a recommendation for a range for commercial or what are I, you thinking? 
I could use feedback <laughs> on the I'm types of factors that you feel are important as a regulator to consider commercial price growth from fiscal year 22 to 24 in hospital price. Okay. I can't believe I said I'm that gonna one. I'm going to need to have to think about that one. That's fair. I've been thinking about it for years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, financial benchmarks, I am good. Um, pricing changes. Um, yeah, some of the decision I, point or kind of due process concern is, you know, these things are often rolling out while we're reviewing budgets. Right. And so, yeah, if we're going to decide to do that as part of our decision making, I think it just should be codified in the guidance. Yeah, okay. I I will also think about that. Okay. Sorry, I don't have anything off the top of my head. And then I think the issue with bad debt and free care, just to make sure I understand, is that um, bad debt and free care is typically calculated in the hospital budgets as a proportion of the expected revenue, not necessarily based on what actually happened. Correct. Um, so how, like, so then thinking about the ratios versus um, yeah, what's actually um, budgeted, yeah. like how those fit together. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, this isn't, um, this isn't an area that would typically uh, be, you know, regulated on. Um, so, you know, it, it's not to say it shouldn't be, but it's just, you know, there's less kind of um, evidence uh, in the kind of financial regulation uh, literature on this. Yeah. Um, I guess I would say I have appreciated getting that information through the healthcare advocates um, questions in prior budget hearings, you know, understanding that it doesn't necessarily have a direct relationship to the budget and amount, it still is helpful to kind of understand what's going on with their patient population. So um, I would be interested in uh, understanding that just as one person, if other people are. Um, and I think those were my questions. So I'm going to, I think I'm going to be quiet and think about things while other people ask their questions. Great, thank you. Um, Member Holmes? Yeah. Um, uh, thank you to you, Sarah. And, and I'll just say, uh, this is a lot to digest in, you know, in the last hour or so. So I, I think, um, but because this is a significant departure from what we've been doing for a while, so I take some time to think about it. Um, some instant reactions are, I, I am happy to have an approach. I think there's much more data and evidence than we've ever had before. And I think that's going to be really helpful. Um, and I like the approach of, of to compare performance and um, allowing us, you know, just a, a deeper look into the hospitals trying to regulate. Um, I like the move away from budgets to actuals as a starting point of looking at, you know, fiscal year 22. Our analysis of the budgets from actual versus this budget to budget fiction that we've been. Um, and again, <laughs> excuse me, I also like the movement away from NPR uh, such a focus on NPR towards expenses. Um, so those, you know, kind of some instant reactions to to the process change or the emphasis change. I, I have, you know, so as I I share, I want to say I, I share Robin uh, aspirational budgeting. We've we've seen that in the past where hospitals are effectively, you know, creating budgets that they can't meet how we're going to assess whether the revenue assumptions that come in with a budget and whether they're really going to be able to make the margins that uh, based on the utilization based on the price to throw that out there i think that's important for us to think about is how we're going to make sure that we're not approving aspirational budgets that will have a negative margin um i i i, I want to think about these thresholds carefully I need a little bit more time to be thinking about that. I, I do want to also say that they are all about um, 
reasonableness of expense growth. And as you said, Sarah, it doesn't speak to the reasonableness of the base from which these expenses are growing. That a lot of that staff analysis that you put on the last slide is going to speak to some of the reasonableness of the underlying base. Uh, I don't know how we then use that data when we use that data, right? Hospital comes in and has met all of the threshold guidelines growth, but then additional data uh, informs the board that the base is not quite reasonable. I don't know how we're going to that conversation in the in the hospital budget process. So I, I just want to throw that out there that, a, that we're going to see a lot more data than we've ever seen before because of the comprehensive analysis that the staff are doing and giving us. Um, and how do we how do we use that information um, decisions? I, I think needs to be more carefully thought out. Um, but I'm happy to start thinking about that. Um, the there are a couple of questions. The on one of the slides, I think Sarah, you had per capita per capita, and I totally understand times who gets to be counted as you know in that per capita. Um, I'm just wondering how we're going to think about, and I think you you mentioned this um, factor, but the demographic shifts, right? So the fact that you know some areas could be seeing expense growth that are thresholds because of population shifts, and other areas are are going to come way under our thresholds, but because they're having population shrink, you know, in their areas. And so how are we thinking about changes and demographic changes and Thresholds um, is another area. Utilization has done a lot of work on avoidable utilization, potentially avoidable utilization. Are we going to be factoring in any measures of potentially avoidable utilization in our looks at utilization itself? So um, wanted to throw that in there as well. Um, and to answer all these questions, I'm throwing them out there though. There's things that are on my list here that I've been jotting. Um, patient access, maybe this is one you can possibly answer. Patient access, you've mentioned there'll be a measure included in the guidance, but I don't think it was said what that measure was. And I wasn't sure what organization we should be partnering with to do, to get at the... Uh... <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I have uh, requested uh, Boz to suggest a wait time measure that all the hospitals uh, would be capable of producing. Um, it's not an easy thing to measure at a hospital level. Um, so I think that, uh, again, that we could use a more comprehensive framework. Um, I also know that there is a proposed federal rule uh, for QHPs for network adequacy, which will have some wait time measures. Um, so seeing how those develop, it's always helpful to have something that, you know, has benchmarks nationally uh, to consider. Um, and so, you know, that might be an area to explore as that emerges. Um, uh, but yeah, I think that for me, when I think about access, you know, I think about, um, you know, the people who aren't seeking care, particularly preventative care, um, and kind of getting our, our arms wrapped around uh, those kind of uh, population based measures. And so I would love to engage with, um, you know, another agency um, to kind of provide some uh, objective reports on how that looks in Vermont. Uh, that would obviously be an expense to the Green Mountain Care Board, but I think a worthy one. Um, and, you know, lots of potential names come to mind, but I think, yeah, we should probably um, talk to agencies before I start volunteering them here. <laughs> um, but yeah, because I, I think like, uh, you know, if if people aren't seeking care at all, that's an, that's just an important consideration uh, in one of the board's charges here. So, um, and as I said, you know, if you think about access, um, it it is much bigger than than a hospital per se. And so, like thinking through that um, and what portion of that makes sense for hospital kind of performance assessment, um, I think just needs a lot more consideration. Yeah, I agree. Um... Okay, I, I think the other one that I'm just still stuck on is, and I guess Robin had the similar questions, was the commercial rate and the recommendations there. And I, I, one is gonna be the trickiest, it sounds like. 
Um, and the one that we don't have anything to work with yet. So I'm just trying to figure out in some sense that is going to be the stickiest one to, I think, all agree on what is a reasonable range of commercial rate and increases. And I think it, to some degree, is going to depend on the base, again, that people, that hospitals are starting at. You know, how do we start to think about that? So I feel like you've given us things to think about. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure I'm going to have more questions, which I will happily follow up on. But I appreciate all and there's so much about this, like the data-driven focus, the movement to actuals, the benchmarks, um, and trying a consistent way of, of, of regulating hospitals that hospitals will understand in advance um, of our process. So uh, there's a lot to like, and I have to just digest a lot of uh, process questions. Work. Thank you. Okay. Um, Dr. Merman? I think he quit. Just kidding. I don't know. It looks like he dropped. <laughs> um, I know he's remote today and then he was having some um, access issues, not in the medical sense, um, the broadband sense. Um, <clears throat> well, I'll go ahead then um, and he can chime in um, if he comes back. A um, couple processy questions. Um, if you go through the, you know, thresholds and the increases in costs and utilization, how does it ultimately work? Do we add up all of those things and then that's the amount of money that is budgeted? Is that is it just a math problem at that point or how does that work? Yep. Yeah. And so, you know, while it feels like a great departure probably, and I understand that, you know, essentially, you know, what we've done in the past is figured out how much NPR is needed. Um that the hospital is proposing their budget, driven by all these factors that we haven't maybe um, kind of gone through. Um, but I think that in that exercise, we've largely treated the budgeted expenses as fixed uh, with a solve for, for the commercial rate. And so this idea would be, well, what does that expense growth look like? Um, and how does that back into your NPR requirements? So the budget order would still be for a, a, an NPR certain and likely a commercial um, price amount or rate certain, uh, but we would just be getting there uh, through the back door, <laughs> so to speak. And are those threshold ranges in the guidance binding on the board? For example, if a a range is five to ten percent. Can the board say no? You know, we think in this circumstance it should be three or twelve. So I think that's the question: um, is what the board does uh, if someone submits a budget and all the parameters are below the threshold, uh, but the NPR growth, you know, ends up being a number that's hard to stomach. Uh, what the board would do, um, and I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, but I think it's important that that's addressed in the guidance. Uh, it just what the board is going to do in that circumstance as as much as we can um, tell tell the regulated entities. But you know, when I when I look, you know, this is the graph that really freaks me out. Like, like I, I think like there's just a lot of recovery uh, for our our hospitals, and and um, so like. I hear aspirational budgets and and uh, worry about negative margins. I think there's worries about negative margins no matter what in the current environment. And um, so, you know, that that's part. And, and I think also starting from an actual base instead of a budgeted base will also help mitigate some of that concern. <clears throat> So a lot of this is sort of trend based and there can often be a lag in the data or unforeseen circumstances. For example, um, take COVID, right? Like that's an easy one, an obvious one that really changed all these numbers. If we had done this approach heading into COVID, the hospitals would be in a really bad situation because all of a sudden their expenses were sky high compared to what it had been in the two years, four years beforehand. How do we adjust for that? 
Yeah, so we have um, a policy on budget adjustments and uh, amendments uh, that hospitals uh, invoke. And depending on when it is in the year, it depends on whether that would be uh, a mid-year uh, process or whether it would be incorporated in a future budget year. Um, but I think when acts of God or other major disruptive events happen, that um, that uh, often uh, we are offered regulatory flexibility um, federally and uh, at the state level. Okay. Um, I'll repeat the concerns that others had about the presumption that is baked in that all the the baselines are accurate, and we don't we don't know that to be true or not. Um, we all hope that all of our hospitals are operating as efficiently and effectively as possible, but I don't know that we know that to be the case. And I think there should be some discretion to certainly review that and adjust um, the baseline if appropriate. Um, so I just put in a plug for how do we how do we adjust if need be um, from the baseline because otherwise these costs are just they're they're baked in for years and years and years to come. Um, I had two other quick ones. Um, um, one is this uh, concept of affordability and how does that overlay in all of this? Um, if no one if these increases are fair and appropriate, but no one can afford them, well, that's really problematic given our purpose and direction as a board, right? So there has to be some level of understanding um, what to do about that. Um, and the other comment I would have is, um, I'm curious about how we consider, if we consider the impact that these um, budget changes would have on the broader healthcare market. We've heard at least people complain, and we don't know if it's totally borne out by data or if it's accurate or whatever, but people say that the independents and the primaries have a hard time um, negotiating and have less negotiation leverage. And if a hospital increase is at a very high level, they're in a more difficult situation. And certainly the independents have a lot of the same headwinds that hospitals have. Yet we don't have a review of their increases and they're not really essentially um, able to get the increase from their costs. So how do we consider the broader healthcare market in that context, if we consider it? Yeah, I think that's a delicate, um, complex uh, subject. Uh, I, I do think, So in my mind, there's like what we monitor as a regulator and what we apply for a specific service. And so um, I think that I personally have a lot more to understand about how these things co-vary uh, in the evidence uh, before I can uh, expound on that in any helpful way. <laughs> um, but I, I, to me, I, and like just shooting from the hip, like I, I think like figuring out some of these efficiency metrics will be particularly helpful in uh, thinking through some of those market dynamics. <clears throat> and on the um, cost um, uh, slide, I forget what number it was. Uh, sorry, no, I think it's slide 35, the commercial um, price. Should we also consider the commercial prices for various similar services, a basket of them or whatever is appropriate for what independents charge? Um, that's question one. And then question two is I think some hospitals would uh, suggest that they use some of their increased commercial price um, to offset expenses in other areas that are um, beneficial to Vermonters, right? So it's not necessarily the case that because a price is high, it should be reduced if there's some other benefit that we're getting from it. So those are two questions, just whether or not we also look at um, independent prices and also, um, you know, if there's an offsetting benefit to somebody having a higher price. Geez, bunch of lobs today, guys. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we, we can take those up later, Sarah, but those are just up my notes and thoughts. Thank you. All right, I'll turn it to Dr. Merman. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I've been having technical difficulties today, but hopefully you all can hear me okay. 
Um, so Sarah, I mean, uh, again, this is like such a heavy lift with you and your team, and I, I can't thank you enough for for going through this process. And and um, and and I think this is, I agree, a first step towards a, a bigger review of the hospital budget process. Having not been through the process before, like Robin and Jess and Tom, um, a lot of this is theoretical to me. Although I've you know watched a lot of prior hearings and thought a lot about it, so. Anyways, that's sort of my general caveat and thoughts about it. You did bring up this interesting question, which I and you asked for our ideas, but actually, since you say you've been thinking it for a while, I'd love your ideas on it. Which is so, and 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 I guess I'm going to precede that with the, with this idea that would really be helpful to me is actually to run through three or four different hypothetical examples and put them through this through this this process and sort of see where we where we end up and how how to think about those. But if we were to put a hypothetical example through this budgetary process and and have one that was way under thresholds, uh, you know what what you know you asked us what what you, what our thoughts on what we should do with that budget. But what are you, having thought about it a lot? What are your thoughts on what we should do with that that budget? So I think that um, that. Uh, at a minimum, trying to think through some of these price and utilization uh, changes uh, by some major buckets, inpatient, outpatient, professional, other. Uh, that is very helpful in terms of um, that is, you know, how the negotiation with the commercial sh insurer will work versus just an overall change in NPR or an overall change in charge um, is maybe not as actionable uh, for that dynamic. So I think right there that's that's a win uh i think you know an overall aggregate change uh is hard to interpret uh there's a lot of ways to get to a margin and so you know commercial price is a very high level uh indicator um and so one of the fundamental kind of essential questions i grapple with is um you know why do we care about reimbursement variation as a regulator, and 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 what about it do we think needs regulating? Um, so we might have high prices because there's high costs, because it's a very difficult area to access, and so it feels like perhaps a necessary expense. Uh, and then there might be prices that are high because of uh, incredible leverage in a negotiation. And just looking at data, you can you know, tease out some of that, but it isn't, there are, you know, I would just say that there's not a lot of silver bullets here. Um, the the price, you know, yeah. I, I, <laughs> and then, you know, there's all these, I, yeah, oh God, I'm sorry. Well, I guess I'm trying to get to understand this. So say, say we have a hospital that has um, done a really great job with figuring out how to manage their labor costs and their labor costs come in under. Uh, and they've been able to figure out how to negotiate really well pharmaceutical costs, the pharmaceutical costs come under. And in, in a sense, you know, and their utilization's right on target, and, uh, you know, maybe they're out, maybe they've improved their access, maybe their utilization's over target. But like, how do we reward I mean, I guess in a sense, like what I would want to do is try to figure out how to reward an organization for being operationally uh, efficient and, uh, you know, and and putting in op great operational processes. But like, how do you do that in a hospital budget process? You know, like, is that maybe I'm thinking of that wrongly? I don't think, I mean, I don't think it's right or wrong. I, I think these are like policy questions and, you know, like um, valid questions that you're raising. Um, I'm here to help answer questions more than ask them. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, and I think like that's exactly as we think towards trying to get towards more, you know, set, fixed, prospective, 
payment, um, that's exactly the type of things that we're going to have to untangle. And, you know, over time, have the less and less luxury of using claims-based uh, information to that. So that's part of why we need to get our utilization information right. I think we need to figure out the quality. You know, there's all these things that are going to be much more material when you think about kind of a fixed uh, overall amount uh, than kind of the way things work today. Um, but, you know, the other thing that I always I, I think is really important is that, you know, these budgets go through local boards. You know, the, we are not the only ones looking at these. And, you know, they're they're the ones that are connected to those communities. And, you know, I think that some of some of your concerns, like I, I often wonder what the role of the statewide regulator is versus kind of that local control. Um, and, and I don't know. The, I don't have a great answer for what that is. And it, probably not the same over time. <laughs> Yeah, I guess that leaves a, I, I, I guess to me, what would be really helpful in thinking about how how to work through these and how to think about all these would be would be a few examples. Yep. You know, draw up three or four different hypothetical hospital examples um, and just sort of see what, you know, when we put those inputs in, what's the output? And then how do we think about that output to consider what, what that means with regards to a hospital budget? Um, you know, I think... I think I share, you know, the the rest of the care board's view that, you know, the, through this process, we're trying to improve access, um, you know, decrease costs, improve quality, have a thriving healthcare system in Vermont, and you know, and so how how I guess I'm just trying to put together in my head how we can then take this process, and I think that you've done a great job with this, and I think this is really much more impactful than our prior process into getting towards those goals, but I, I just have it a yeah, I just having a hard time sort of wrapping my whole head around when a budget pops out the other side with a certain number and there's variances above and below these thresholds and we do comparison hospitals and we see that they're, you know, um, varying in their performance compared to comparison hospitals, how we then take that into an actual item at the end of a, of a budget that's either adjusted or not adjusted. Um, so... Sorry for the rambling comment there, but I think I think what would really help for me, and I just keep saying this over and over again, so sorry about that, but is to to have some specific example. Yes, we we will get that pull, to pull together for next week. <clears throat> awesome, thank you so much. It's great. Can I just actually make a suggestion, Sarah? That might be help. Um, it might be helpful to look at last year's budget submissions and just see if some as you know what would have happened if we had applied some of these thresholds to last year's budget process a couple of sample hospitals way to make that hypothetical actually come to life a little bit you betcha um Dr. Merman's comment sort of grabbed me as what it, about rewarding hospitals for operational efficiency. If they do really, to me, that seems like a positive, right? If they can then invest that money in doing something else, that seems like a good thing, right? So if they're really, really efficient, that's something we want to reward. Um, the other thing I, I just thought of, Sarah, when you mentioned if, um, you know, the universe changes and hospitals need a modification, they can come in, which seems appropriate and like a good good process. What happens on the other side if, let's say, just hypothetically, a surgical group leaves and all of a sudden they can't do any of those surgeries? Does Is there a modification the other way as well? Yes, there is. Um, and we also have requirements for um, what we call provider transfers. So if a practice were to join or leave uh, a hospital, um, that might be a reason that a budget would need uh, to be amended uh, mid-year. Okay, thank you. Um, and I appreciate the, the attention you've given, um, especially myself and Dave as new members um, learning this process. Uh, alternate your advocate. Thanks much, Chair Foster. Um, thank you, Sarah, and the team for all your hard and thoughtful work on this. Uh, we're we're supportive of the guidance um, and being a health policy nerd like myself, I can honestly say I enjoyed the opportunity talking with you about it uh, and the opportunity to learn from each other. Um, sorry, that's my dog yawning. That's a very embarrassing sounding sound. Um, 
and we we look for we think this is a step in the right direction. I mean, I think you framed it rightly, Sarah, as a bridge year. Um, and we definitely support streamlining the hospital budget process to collecting more actionable and standardized data. I think, as members have said, the suggested switch to more actual data, I think, is a welcome one, um, one that we definitely support. Um, a few brief comments I just want to make. Um, I, I do think that there's a need for the board to consider some type of consumer ability to pay some affordability measure. This is tricky. I mean, uh, folks talk about the affordability index a fair amount. I'm a little bit wary of indices because they don't always account for regional and state specific variation, but I think that's one place for the board to consider. And there's also out of pocket spending medians and the IRS has an ACA affordability test. So, I mean, this, these are some ideas that I'm sure folks have thought of, but um, I do think this is important to at least try to capture it and recognize that like all metrics they are imperfect. Um, I appreciate the discussion on free care and bad debt. I, I think from the vant from our vantage point, it is a measure of operational efficiency, how effective a hospital's billing practices and procedures are. And we our office believes that it should be considered like a key performance indic indicator, excuse me, like operating margin or days cash on hand. And I mean, the reason we raise this is you know, from actual data that we see over year over year, the hospitals recuperate very little of these costs and they could have real, very real benefit, not necessarily if it's doled out as free care, but as patient financial assistance. Not every person who's eligible, you know, will be paying or will be giving free care. They'll be given discounted care at an 80% or 60% level. Um, so I'm aware of the limitations that that ratio has, but I think that can be mitigated to a certain degree by looking at the trend over time using actual data which I know is the central part of this guidance. Um, so I think I'll just, I'll, I'll leave it there. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot to mull over, um, but thank you, Sarah. And thanks for the board for the opportunity to comment on it. Thank you. Um, and I'll put it up to public comment via the raise your hand function. Um, Mike Del Chaco, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair Foster. I, I had a lot of prepared remarks, and I just sort of put them aside because um, this is completely uh, new, and I understand the work, and I really appreciate Sarah and her team's uh, work in reaching out to the hospital um, community uh, to talk about some of the challenges with the old uh, guidance, the lack of predictability, and the and and sort of the difficulty in measuring um, uh, some of the some of what's been report, reported and submitted in a budget, and then how it is reacted or reacted to, and then decisions are made. Um, I've heard a lot of uh, interesting conversation here today. Um, things that come to mind uh, are slide six to me. Um, we have a capacity, a workforce, and a financial crisis. And we're talking about um, uh, sort of benchmarking to national rates. I would want to make sure um, in, in all of these uh, areas, we're talking about uh, benchmarking and what are national rates. How, how does this r relate and trans, trans, uh, transfer to the rural marketplace? Um, how do we, what does it take to access a physician or recruit a physician versus a, a, a larger labor market? What do some of those uh, instances and occurrences um, look like? Um, there's an affordability discussion that has happened here today. How do we marry affordability with keeping places uh, open? Um, we talked about rewarding. Typically, a reward has looked like a penalty because it's called enforcement. Um, enforcement has only been acted by um, typically reducing um, rates or taking away um, opportunity uh, of uh, higher bottom lines, um, it hasn't been it hasn't been looked at from the lens of of um, we anticipated this result, um, we didn't achieve the following result. So um, should we have opportunity to increase when we don't have those occurrences for um, uh, around our budget or for that matter, in this moment, we're talking a re reward. Um, I think the 
Um, there's a lot to digest here. Uh, again, um, I hope that we have an opportunity to bring this piece of work and information back to some of the um, experts in this area for feedback. Um, it's, a, it's an incredible body of work. There's a lot here. Um, and we need to sort of digest this in a way that we can figure out how we manage and work through this. I'd also want to know um, how do we consider and think about costs or expenses that are truly outside of our control? Um, you know, there's these uh, interesting fine lines of labor and the, and the labor market. Is that in our control? Is it out of our control? Um, um, contract labor, is that in our control or out of our control? Uh, pharmaceutical expenses in our control or out of our control. How do we how do we narrate and think about those items and and what would happen and how would you react to information that uh, an organization brings forward that is contradictory um, because of their local experience but doesn't have a national benchmark behind it when they when they present to you. Um, how are the, how would those things be evaluated? Um, typically, the coming back in and having a conversation again is not um, is very difficult to uh, I'll call it win or achieve the desired goal of a hospital getting relief. Um, so those are all things that I think we need to evaluate and think about as we move through um, through this. And and I again I appreciate all of the hard work to to narrow to make this more predictable to work together to, to for for all of the common reasons that we have I, you know we're 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 trying to all do the same thing and i understand that so um appreciate it and i'll stop there because um i think it's a good spot to stop great thank you very much for your comment um any other public comments Uh, Walter, please go ahead. Thanks, Owen. Um, I, I follow all the people that have commended Sarah for doing this. I hope she gets a raise. I probably would have committed suicide having to go through all these numbers as I'm not a numbers person. But I just have a, a real comment is all these crises we talk about in the budget and everything else are not by osmosis, they've been created by the hospital business models. And that the only thing that's exceptional about American healthcare right now is how complicated it is and how simple it should be. That's it. Great. Thank you. And fortunately for the Green Mountain Care Board, Sarah loves numbers and is wonderfully skilled with them. Um, I can see that. To our, to our benefit. <laughs> Yeah. Um, any other public comment? Great. Um, Ms. Lindbergh, I will release you from the hot seat. Thank you for all this work. Um, I've seen you working very late the last couple of weeks, and I know it's been challenging. So I just want to recognize that and thank you for it. It's amazing to me, honestly, how often I see staff working really crazy hours because um, I know it's a lot of work. So thank you for all that effort, Sarah. Um, uh, is there any old business to come before the board? I have some old business to come before the Please. board today. Um, so I thought it might be helpful to give a little bit of an update on the hospital budget, um, the hospital global budget technical advisory group, which has had at this point three meetings. Um, this will be a bit of an informal update I, um, for now. We can certainly think about doing a more formal uh, presentation with slides if that's of interest, but I thought I just wanted to give people a brief um, update. So as I said, we've had three meetings. Um, all of the presentations from these meetings are on the Green Mountain Care Board website, and I was going to suggest if maybe Kristen could link um, to that that part of our site so that it would be handy for folks. Um, the plan is to meet approximately every three weeks between uh, when we started and through November. Um, at the first meeting, it was really an introductory meeting where we reviewed the basic components of 
involved in developing a global budget and reviewed what has been done for other states, which would include Maryland and Pennsylvania, as well as the CMS model that are out there, which are in Maryland, Pennsylvania. And then there's also a model called CHART, um, which they suspended, but gives you a little bit of uh, insight into their thinking. So if anyone wants a primer, I would recommend the slides from the introductory meeting. Um, in the second meeting, we started to discuss what what types of services should be included in a in a global hospital budget. Um, in both Maryland and Pennsylvania, the budgets are limited to inpatient and outpatient hospital services, but there was definitely interest in the group broadly to look at it, including uh, professional services and to ensure alignment um, across the full budget. That's, you know, obviously in Vermont and in our budget process, we do that as well. Um, and then there was quite a discussion about our are there other, oh, and I should say the professional services that were discussed are professional services billed under the hospital's um, tax ID number. Um, so again, kind of making sure it was connected, those services were connected to uh, someone who's employed at the hospital. Um, there was a bunch of discussion around other types of hospital owned entities. So as folks may know, some hospitals own skilled nursing facilities or dialysis. Um, and while there was sort of conceptual interest in including potentially those types of services, there was a recognition that really to understand the dynamics and whether you were creating a positive or negative uh, financial incentive, you'd really have to delve into each particular type of entity and do a much deeper dive. So we kind of put that in a parking lot. Um, I think from my perspective also, there's we have to think about if if we do pursue this, what is really operationally feasible in year one versus year two versus year three. So I think that's another, we have time for some of those other services, assuming uh, for the sake of my presentation for the moment that we actually would move forward with it, which is an assumption, not a done deal. Um, there was thought about excluding potentially some high cost, low volume services like, for example, transplants, um, which is very low volume in Vermont and uh, just at UVM. We haven't made it, any recommendations developed yet there, but that's the another piece that's outstanding. And then in the third meeting, we started to turn to um, population. So of course, for any specific hospital, they have major payers in Vermont, like Blue Cross, MVP, Cigna, Aetna. Um, and then they'll have a bunch of smaller payers that they interact with, either because someone from out of state used the hospital, or um, you know, there are some Vermonters who have insurance from out of state employers. So there might be a few, a um, few folks who work in that kind of a situation. So we started to go through data to kind of outline um, when does small get too small and what makes sense to, um, to, to as a cutoff potentially. Um, and we didn't really get to um, a decision point there that we're gonna be coming back to that in meeting four. So that's that's really where we are right now. But you can see we're we're really delving into the the minutia and the details. And I think the slides are very helpful in terms of providing data about each of the points. And and there is a summary of the prior meetings discussion in the next meeting slide. So for example, the discussions for meeting one will be summarized at the beginning of meeting two, and similarly two and three. So that's my brief update and happy to do something more formal at a future meeting if that's of interest. Great, thank you very much. I, I think something more formal down the road would be beneficial as we go through the process. So we can definitely talk about that. Um, is there any, I was just thinking about this, I'm not really sure the distinction between old business and new business, but is there any new business? For what it's worth, I picked and old business because Sarah had done a presentation about the tag earlier. So it was a topic that we had at least discussed. So, but other than that, I don't know how you pick either. Yeah, it kind of felt sort of new to me, but yeah. Um, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved.
Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Great. Everyone have a nice day and thank you very much.